If you're visiting with us this morning, we are in a January series that we do every year, and it's pertaining to stewardship. And the basic premise behind biblical stewardship is that we are all stewards of God's stuff. Every single one of us is a steward. Either we are a good and faithful steward, or we are a bad and unfaithful steward, but we are all stewards of God's stuff. The world, we're told, is his creation. Its wealth and its possessions are also God's creation. In fact, even your life, your family, your children are all by God's creation, and they all belong to him. Everything that we have, we have received from God. Everything. And catch this. There's not one thing that God has given to you and not one thing that God has given to me that he gave to us without a purpose and without an expectation for us in how we are to invest it. He trusted it into our care. And I realize that if this is the first of one of these kinds of messages that you have ever heard, you are probably thinking to yourself, no, you don't understand, Pastor. I worked really hard to get the things that I have and to be where I am in life. And I I don't doubt that one bit whatsoever. But let me ask you the question, who gave you the ability to work? And who gave you the job that you are working at and the pay that you are receiving and the skill that you have to do what you do? We understand that God did that. And the word of God tells us in a lot of different places, but Psalm 24, verse 1, is as good as any other. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. Everything belongs to the Lord. And so just as a quick review, here are some basic principles that we have already covered and we're going to see over and over again in God's word. Every time that you find a passage that has something to do with stewardship, you're going to find one, if not all, of these principles. And number one is, as I've already made mention, God owns everything. We own nothing. Number two, in the stuff that we have, God has given to us. Number three, what he's given is an opportunity for us. And we talked a lot about that in the last message last week. It is an opportunity for us to invest on God's behalf. It's an opportunity to prove our trustworthiness as one of his stewards. But stewardship is an opportunity. And with that opportunity, it carries a responsibility, if you remember that. And then the third thing is, it also will bring accountability. One of these days, we will be accountable for our stewardship of what God has trusted unto us. And so that's just kind of a review of where we are this morning. In Luke chapter 16, well, let's just go ahead. We'll just jump right into it. And we're going to read verses 1 through 13 this morning. And then we'll go back through and we'll kind of break this down and see how it applies to us today. Um, If you're looking for a three-point sermon today, you're not going to get one. I think I've got six points and then some more after that, some sub points. So we're going to have a blast today. Amen. Hey, it is the word of God. It is the word of God. You are not wasting your time by being here. This is a great investment for you in your Christian life. All right, so verse one says this. And he, speaking of Jesus, he said unto his disciples, there was a certain rich man which had a steward and the same was accused unto him that he had wasted his goods. And he called him and said unto him, how is it that I hear this of thee? Give an account of thy stewardship, for thou mayest be no longer steward. Then steward said within himself, What shall I do? For my Lord taketh away from me the stewardship. I cannot dig. To beg I am ashamed. I am resolved what to do. That when I am put out of the stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. So he called every one of his Lord's debtors unto him. And he said unto the first, How much owest thou unto my Lord? And he said, A hundred measures of oil. And he said unto him, Take thy bill, sit down quickly, and write fifty. Then said another, he said, Then said he to another, And how much owest thou? And he said, A hundred measures of wheat. And he said unto him, Take thy bill and write fourscore. And the Lord commended the unjust steward, because he had done wisely. For the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. And I say unto you, make to yourself friends of the mammon of unrighteousness, that when ye fail, they may receive you into everlasting habitations. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. 
If therefore ye have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? And if ye have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? Now here's the context in which Jesus says this well-known saying. Verse 13. No servant can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. You cannot serve God and mammon. So after having spoken directly to the Pharisees, the scribes, the religious leaders in the previous chapter, Jesus begins in this chapter by now turning his attention to specifically his disciples. Now, the Pharisees, the scribes, and everybody else is there in the crowd and they're listening, but this is for the intention of the disciples to hear and for them to begin to learn from this and to apply. And Jesus gives them his, or gives them this parable. Just by a show of hands this morning, are you a disciple of Jesus Christ? Let me see it. Amen? All right, so this is not just to, to these disciples, it's to us as well today. The definition of a steward is this, someone who is trusted to faithfully manage the account and affairs of another on their behalf. I'll say it again. Someone who is trusted to faithfully manage the account and affairs of another on their behalf. Right from the get-go in this parable, we see this steward has, a, has failed to do what he is supposed to do. He has failed to be a faithful steward. He had a problem, point number one. He had a problem. And his problem was, as Jesus puts it, he was wasteful. Look there again at the end of verse one. It tells us he had wasted his master's goods. He was wasteful. His unfaithfulness was obvious based on the fact that when his master trusted him with things, he looked out and he heard from from everybody else, man, this guy's just wasting what you have. Where's the increase? Where's the production? Where's the investments? Do you see what he's doing with your money? And the guy hadn't seen, and that's why clearly it says he just heard. He had heard from other people, this guy's wasting your investments. He had a problem as a steward. Now, let me just tell you, while that's a problem for any steward, this is especially a problem for us who are Christians, and and we are expected to be stewards of God's goods. Not simply with finances and wealth, but God trusts us with all kinds of things. Everything that we have, whether it be our time, as Ephesians 16 tells us that we are to be redeeming the time, or whether it be our opportunities, Galatians 6.10 tells us this, as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, or whether we are stewarding our God-given gifts and our abilities, as Galatians 6.10 says, as we therefore have opportunity, let us do good unto all men. Listen, in, 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 I'm sorry, our God-given grace, our God-given gifts, um, they're in uh, 1 Peter is what it was, verse 10. Look at this, 1 Peter 4.10, As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Now understand that that word grace at the very end is actually gifts as well. It's the Greek word charis, which mainly speaks of God's favor and his pleasure and that he shows unto us. And so whether it be our time or opportunities or whether it be gifts and abilities, we are to, we are to be stewarding this in, 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 um, in investing it into the eternal kingdom for God's glory. But did you know that in 1 Corinthians 4, 2, which tells us, moreover, it's required for stewards that a man be found faithful. We talked about that last week. I brought that up. Did you know that in the context of Paul writing this, it is in regards to being a good steward in handling the word of God? He's actually speaking to teachers and preachers in that that instance, and he's telling them, listen, you you can't just take the word of God and you can't twist it and you can't manipulate it to say what you want it to say. You need to be a good steward of even the word of God. And if you're a believer here today, you also are expected to be a good steward of the word of God. We're not to make it appear to say something that it doesn't say. To appease our lifestyle or to appease somebody else and what they think about us. It is God's word and we are going to be held accountable one of these days on how we steward it. There's nothing greater that God has trusted to us than the stewardship of his truth, of his word. 
Because within his word is found the words of life. Within his word is found the words of eternal life. It is the message of salvation. And so whatever it is, I go back to what I was saying, whatever it is that God has given to us to steward, this is an issue when his stewards are wasteful with those things. Consider this when we think about a wasteful servant or a wasteful steward. How much time is wasted today? How much wasted opportunities are there to be a blessing? Or how much do people waste their gifts, their talents, their abilities on things and in areas that their master does not approve of? Let me ask, how much do we waste out of the things that God gives to us. We need to be on high alert to protect ourselves from wasting, from squandering our master's goods because here's point number two. There's going to come a day of proving. We're gonna be proved one of these days. A day when we will all give an account or proof of what it is that we have done with everything that God has trusted unto us. Verse two tells us here in our text that the master said unto the steward, how is it that I hear this of thee? Give an account of thy stewardship, for thou mayest be no longer steward. Just like this steward in this text, we are going to be called on one of these days to give an account. All that we have done with what God has given to us in this life will be proved. I talked again about this last week in last week's message, but I want to go a little bit more detail this week. In, first, or in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we're told this. Wherefore, we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Now that word acceptance that the Apostle Paul uses here in verse 9 is not acceptance into heaven. That's not the acceptance we're talking about when we stand at the judgment seat of Christ here. That's not what what he's referencing. This judgment that he's referencing in this verse is referring to the Bema seat of Christ, which is a place of reward where every believer is going to appear one day. And that's where we're going to be proved. Our lives are going to be proved with the way that we stewarded the things that God has given to us. This is not the great white throne judgment. This is a different judgment. The great white throne judgment is where everyone who rejects salvation, everyone who rejects the forgiveness of their sin that's available through Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, this is where they're going to appear. And after they appear there, then the angels are going to take them and cast them into the eternal lake of fire. For that's the great white throne judgment. We're talking about the bema seat of Christ. We're talking about the judgment seat of Christ here. This is where we who are believers are going to stand, not for judgment on whether or not we're going into heaven, but based on stewardship on how how we lived our life, what we did in the name of Christ for God's glory. That's what he's talking about here when he's talking about being accepted. The acceptance of verse 9 is the the theme of what last week's message was. We want to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. That's the acceptance he's talking about in verse 9. It's the acceptance of having lived out a life that is honorable before God and that is as a faithful steward of his. But like this servant, none of us know when that time's going to be. None of us know. It's different for for all of us. We don't know. God knows because God's numbered our days. But we don't know. And therefore, we must be mindful that it could happen any day and at any time. And so we have got to be busy investing and not wasting God's resources. Listen, time is of the essence. There will be consequences that are going to be paid for our stewardship or lack thereof. There will be consequences because there are going to be eternal rewards that are either lost or gained based off that criteria. What kind of steward were you? You see, (laughs) heaven is not going to be a place of of equal, even Stephen, uh, socialism. Everybody gets the same thing, all right? It's based upon what you do in this life, the rewards that you will receive in glory. And I don't have time to go into that, but that is a great study, by the way. Listen, however, to 1 Corinthians 3, 13 through 15, because it gives us insight to that day when we will give an account, when we will be proved, all of our works will be proved in the presence of Jesus Christ 
at the Bema Seat. Listen to what it says here. Every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. And therefore, because of this, Christian, be aware. Be aware because one day our works, our life of stewardship will be proved. And it may look like we're doing so much right now for the glory of God here on this earth. But when we get up there, the intents of our hearts and the purpose for which we did it, was it for the acclaim of others? Was it so that people would look at us and, and, and think better of us? Or was it truly so that God's kingdom would be expanded, souls would be saved, forgiveness would be, would be given to those who cry out for salvation so that God would be glorified? Is that why we do what we do? Is that why we steward the way we steward? Is that why we serve the way we serve? Is that why we, 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 we steward our families and our children the way that we do? Is that why we give to the church and to missions so that God would be glorified? Or do we just do it to ease our conscience and make us feel better? It'll be made manifest in that day. Romans 14, 12 tells us, so then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Pretty simple right there. Every one of us. Give account of yourself. There'll be no pointing fingers. Well, it was because, of, no, no, no. We're worried about you right now. You will give an account of yourself. I want you to notice what happens next. Because in verse three, the steward says this, what shall I do? For my Lord taketh away from me the stewardship. I cannot dig to beg I am ashamed. So this steward comes to the realization that things cannot continue to go on as they have been going. Something's going to have to change. Realizing that he will have to stand before his master and to give an account and he will be proved, he concludes that things are going to have to change in his life and he makes this personal. Point number three, he makes it personal. His stewardship is personal. Again, every one of us will give an account of ourselves. This is a personal thing. He asks the question, what shall I do because it's about me. My stewardship is dependent upon me. This is a personal thing. He's going to have to personally make some changes in how he manages his master's resources. Uh, and he only has a little bit of time. He just got word, hey, get everything in order and come up here before me. He only has a little bit of time. And he realizes the time is of the essence. Listen, if you and I, if we want to stand before our Lord, as faithful stewards, we are going to have to make this personal. This is going to have to be a personal thing for you. We're going to have to personally decide that it is worth it. We're going to have to personally decide that things cannot continue as they are because time is short, eternity is drawing nearer every single day, and this life will soon be passed, and only what's done for Christ is what's going to last. Amen? You have to come to that decision. Listen, it's not, you don't do this. Number one, it won't stick if it's not personal with you. But number two, and the Bible bats this, it, it won't count eternally for you anyway. It won't count if you don't make it personal. If you're just doing it for somebody else. Listen, as a child, you don't do it because your, your parents are making you. You should do it because you have a heart to do it. You shouldn't do it, listen, because the pastor is pressuring you. You shouldn't do it because your peers at church are going to guilt you about it. You should do it because of the goodness in your heart God has laid it upon you and you personally want to make an eternal impact. You realize that what you have, you, you have something to offer for God's glory. I'm not just talking about money again. I'm talking about everything God's given you. God's given you so much that you can use for his glory. You've got to make a personal view for you and say, you know what? This is what matters most. This is a priority for me. This guy had to make it a personal all of a sudden. Things have got to change because I don't have any more time. It's running out. How, isn't it strange that it's most of the time when there are people later on in their lives that begin to realize, boy, life passes by so fast, and they begin to regret not doing more for God. At the, at the beginning of life, they begin to regret that. In fact, oftentimes, they're near the end of their life. They're no longer able to do those things for God. Well, I was going to do it. Well, I'm going to do it. I'll commit to this. I'll start serving. I'll start using my talents. I'll start using my gifts. I'll start giving my money. And then whenever that time comes, they can't because something's changed. And they regret it. 
Time is of the essence. We're running out. 2 Corinthians 9, 7 says, Every man, according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth the cheerful giver. Listen, I don't want you to do it because I'm saying you need to do it, but you do need to do it. I want you to do it because out of the goodness of your heart, you know God has given you what you have because he has a purpose for it and he wants to bless you through doing it. He will glorify himself through it. That's a blessing in and of itself. I'm not telling you that if you do it, that you're gonna get riches and wealth and that kind of blessing. I'm not saying that. But he will bless you for honoring him and doing what he wants you to do with what he's given to you. You're gonna have to personally decide in your heart that this is something that you're going to do. The fourth point once you take it personally to be a faithful steward, you got to make a plan. You got to make a plan on what to do. Look at the servant's words there at the beginning of verse 4. He says, I am resolved. <laughs> I've got the answer. Here's the resolution to my problem. I am resolved what to do. And we're not going to read all the verses here, but he, but, but he basically says, here's what's going to happen. He comes up with a plan so that he would have something to show his master when he has to stand before him. He knows he's going to give an account. He knows he's going to be proved. And so he makes a plan so that he at least has something to show his master. And he wanted to be prepared when he, whenever he went to that meeting. Listen, if we want to be pre- prepared, and if we want to be, uh, appear as wise and faithful stewards before our master, you and I, we have got to plan ahead as well. You have to make a plan to be a good steward. It doesn't just naturally happen. You know what naturally happens? Is I pocket the money and keep going with it, amen? That I use the talent for my pleasure, for my glory. That I use my abilities for that. You see, that's what naturally happens. But as a believer, as a person who's given their life to Jesus Christ, and the Spirit of God begins to prick your heart, and he draws it, he draws it out and he says, hey, listen, here's what I want you to do with what you have. And you begin to make a plan. That's why we do this every year, by the way. It's not because we need more money. Hey, God doesn't need your money. It's his anyway. If he wants it, he'll take it. He's giving you an opportunity, though, for you to give it and be blessed because of it. We do this every year for this reason. It's why we renew our faith promise commitments every January. You know, as a member of Edmund Road Baptist Church, you should see this day coming. You should know that it's coming ahead of time. And you ought to have this thought, you know, I really should start praying and thinking about what God would have me to do this year with what he's trusted me with. I really should. And you got to pray about it. That's why we give you those cards in advance. And we ask you to pray about it for the whole month. Because we want you to sit down with the Lord. And we want you two to make a plan together. You know that old saying is true. Those who fail to plan, plan to fail. And that is so true. People will say, oh, I don't need to plan out my stewardship. I don't need to make a commitment and say that I'm going to try and do this. Hey, listen. You have no idea what the future holds. People say, well, I don't need to do that because um, I'll just provide for the need as I see the needs, as they come up. But you know why that doesn't work? It's because Satan will work overtime, and he will overwhelm you, and he will distract you so that you won't even see those needs whenever they come throughout the year. You won't even consider it. But whenever you make a plan, you make a commitment, and you say, okay, God, you give me this, I, I will give it. If you give it to me, God, then I will give this much. I'm not saying, God, I'm going to give this much whether you give it to me or not because that ain't going to happen. If God doesn't give it, then you don't have to. He, he just released you of that. But we need to make a plan. And besides all that, I believe that our faith honors God and God honors our faith. Amen? Our faith honors him and he honors our faith. I believe God is pleased with forward faith. He's pleased with it. I think of the example of Hannah in 1 Samuel, who was basically, she basically prayed this, Lord, as soon as you give me a child, I will give him right back to you. And forward faith. And what great things God did with that little boy. Not only did he serve there in the temple, but he also came, became a judge over the people and became a prophet to the people. Oh, Samuel. Hebrews eleven six tells us, without faith, it is impossible to please him. So, basically, be sure that you have a plan 
a faith plan. Make sure that you have a plan for how you're going to steward God's gifts and his blessings to you this year and then stick to that plan. Steward well whatever blessings he provides for you. Amen? Verses four through seven. Again, we're not gonna read all these. But here, we're shown the plan that the steward makes. He goes to, to all those who were indebted to his master, right? He's been doing business with them. And he goes to every single one of them. And he begins to will and deal. He begins to make bargains. He begins to slash prices. He begins shaving off the extravagant interest, many believe. It was the extravagant interest that he had been charging them as the steward. He, he, he is basically cutting his own profits, that he was ex- expecting to make off the deals that he had done in the name of his master. He cuts his own profits by doing business with him so that when he's finished, he has this large number of people out here, this multitude who, who are now indebted to him. They feel like they owe him something and they are grateful that, oh, we had this heavy burden and you cut it in half or you cut it in a quarter, you took 20% off or whatever it is. And, and so he's got these fans, he's got these, these people who are, who are friends of his, companions now and associates. And, and who knows, maybe, just maybe one of them or several of them will be so grateful to what he just did that they might just invite him over and make him their steward of their estate. You know, if this one here fires me, well, at least I got these people, maybe they'll welcome me into their homes and I can serve them. Even greater than all this, this man now has, out of what he's redeemed and out of what he's recovered, he now has something to show his current master, his present master. He is now, he, he's acted wisely. He's gone out. He's, he's like, okay, so this is going to sacrifice. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to cut some things here. I'm not going to get everything that I thought I was going to get here, but, but I'm going to at least get what, I owe, what, what the master needs and what he's expecting. And he's able to compile all this, pile all this up and bring it before the master. So we read this in verse eight. And at the end, it says that his Lord commended the unjust steward because he had done wisely. He doesn't, he doesn't commend him for being unjust. Now, that's just the title that the Lord gives this man because of his past. But the man in the parable commends him because what he had done was wise. I mean, talk about a reversal here. This man was about to receive a pink slip, and here's point number five. Now he's being praised. He's about to be fired, and now he's being commended by his master, all of a sudden, he, he begins, the, the master, he looks out and he, and he realizes, wait a second, there's a return here. There's a return on my investment in making you my steward. Well, I, I, I had heard that you weren't doing things well, but look at this. You, you've changed things, and now look at all the stuff that you've brought to me, all the stuff that, that now goes to my estate, all this increase and all this profit. And man, you, all of a sudden, he begins to commend him before his actions. He had trusted him to manage his resources, and now this man brings something forth that he can show that can be proved. The servant had something to show for his stewardship. We need to make sure that we have something to show for our stewardship. I mean, I live a pretty comfortable life. I'm just telling you right now. Compared to the majority of the world, we all do. But is that, sacrif- is that, is that comfort w- worth sacrificing? Is that comfort worth sacrificing for the glory of God? Is giving up a little bit of what he's given me worth sacrificing so that I will have something to show for him as his steward? Our Lord makes a comment now at the second part of verse eight. You see, up to this point in time, it's been the parable. Jesus is telling this parable. And the Lord that's mentioned at the beginning of verse eight was the Lord in the parable. But now our Lord says something about it. Look at what he says here. For the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. And I say unto you, he's talking to his disciples, make to yourself friends of the mammon of unrighteousness, that when ye fell, they may receive you into everlasting habitations. So Jesus is making a contrast here. He's using the wise actions of this steward and he is comparing them to how we as believers ought to operate in this world. He makes this comparison. You see, when this man considered his future, when it became real for him, and he began to consider his future, he was willing to cut costs, he was willing to shave off the interest, he was willing to sacrifice his own present profits in order to reserve a better future for himself. 
And this is what Jesus is pointing out for us. If, we, if this is the way that the lost world and those who are living in this world, if this is how they operate, how much more should we as believers who have an eternal perspective, how much more should we be willing to sacrifice some of the temporary treasures and things that we have been given now in order to reserve a better eternal reward in heaven? That's the point. This is the picture he's bringing out here. If they're willing to do that for th- temporary things that are going to fade away and rust and be stolen and break and have to be replaced here, how much more should we willing, be willing to sacrifice those things for eternal things that never fade away, that we could never lose? That, fra- that phrase, mammon of unrighteousness, in verse 9, that refers to uh, money, wealth, the goods of this world. It's kind of an overarching theme. It's an Aramaic word, but there was actually a deity that they worshiped that this came from, a deity of prosperity, increase. What Jesus is saying is we should use those things. Mammon. God gives us mammon, right? Not the deity, but the actual money, the resources. All. Jesus is saying that we should use those things to make friends, companions, associates, so that when we fell, and that word, that, that, that phrase we fell was a euphemism that they used, which refers to death, dying. We should use those things to make friends so that when we die, those friends will be there to welcome us into glory. That's what Jesus is saying here. It's not for the sake of being welcomed. It's for the sake of them being there. They will be there. If we take those resources that we have been given and we use it for the glory of God, for the kingdom of God, people will be in glory because of that. And this is what he's saying. When we use what God's trusted to us to invest in the souls and eternity of others, when we use what we have to show others the love of Christ so that maybe they would be receptive to the message of Christ, because no longer is it just words that we're saying, but it's actually actions, it's actually real life being lived out before them. When we do this and we use those things to bless them and to care for them, This is one of the things that we ought to do with the resources, with the mammon that God gives to us. Use them to invest in the souls of others and their eternities. Also, we are to use what God has given to us, whether it's our time, our talent, or our treasures, to invest in the ministry of the gospel. Yeah. Use it to invest so that the gospel will go out and be be, uh, uh, scattered throughout the earth so that every tongue and kindred will be able to hear it so that people will be able to hear and and choose for themselves whether they will accept it or whether they will reject it. But we ought to use what God's given to us to to invest in the ministry of the gospel. Now, I'm not just talking about here at ERBC. I know that goes contrary to the stereotypical independent Baptist pastor But I do not believe that everything that you give to the ministry ought to come through this church. Now, I think that if you're a member of this church, it ought to be a priority. But I also believe that there are many other ministries that are out there that are doing a great kingdom work for the glory of God that are worthy of our support and our service and our talents and our gifts. Not if it's robbing the the church that we're a member of, but if we have over and beyond that God's blessed us with, if we have it to give, they're worthy of our support. And we ought to invest in the gospel ministry. I also believe we ought to invest in the missions program. Invest in missions. Invest in missionaries and the missions that they're involved in. Listen, if you invest in the missions program here, you, you may never see those people. You don't know who those people are. You may never talk to them in this life. But I promise you this, that one day, if they believe through, your, if they believe through our missionaries and you get to our missions, one of these days, they, they will be there to welcome you into the everlasting habitation. That's what Jesus is pointing out here. They'll be there to welcome you whenever you come into heaven. And and the reason that they're there is because you gave or because you served or because you made it possible for the missionary to get over there and to deliver the gospel of Jesus to them. They will be there because you gave out of what God has given to you. And those souls, according to Paul in Philippians 4, they will be fruit that abounds to your account. It's as if you yourself led them to Jesus Christ because you gave them missions. Point number six. We see the principle or the purpose behind all this. Jesus explains in verses 10 through 12 again, he that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. 
He that is unjust in the least is, also, is unjust also in much. If therefore you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to you trust, to your trust the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? Bottom line, God wants us to be faithful with what we have in the moment. He wants us to be faithful with what we have right now, currently, presently. He doesn't want you to say, well, I'll be faithful when I reach such and such amount. No, no, no. He wants you to be faithful with where you are right now. Well, I'll be faithful once I get that gift and that talent and that ability, you know, perfected. No, wait a second. There are needs now that you can use them for the glory of God. Start with what you have now, with what he's given you right now, with what he's placed in your hands right now, so that you, through that you're able to prove to him, and you're able to prove to those around you, you're able to prove even to yourself your faithfulness in the least, and God says that will also show that you'll be faithful with much. But you've got to start with the least. You don't just get the much dumped on you. You start with what you have now. And you show you're faithful there. And then God trusts you with more because he knows that you will be faithful with that as well. Now listen, one of the things I was taught, two things. Number one, never make yourself the hero of the story. But number two, as a preacher, don't use yourself as an example. And I hate that. I hate that I'm about to do that. Only because I know there are some who are, well, look at him. He's just so full of himself. He just pat himself on the back. But it, it isn't anything like that. But I have seen this actually play out in my life. I've seen it play out in other people's lives. And I bet you there's many here who can stand up and testify, yes, this is how it works. But let me just tell you, early on, when Ray and I first started giving to missions, I mean, yeah, over and above the tithe, just a young couple, we started giving to missions and this was introduced to us. We weren't given nearly, nearly what we're able to give now. Not at all. And yet every single year that the faith promise commitment came around, there just seemed to be more out of which we were able to give the next year. I mean, it was crazy. And again, this has nothing to do with me, but I'm telling you, first of all, it's because of the goodness and the givingness of our God, and then secondly, because his, wo- his word proves itself true when we carry it out and we practice and apply it in our lives. Start with what you have. Don't say, well, when, I, when this happens. Start with what you have. I realize that not everybody is able to give as much as others. That God's word points that out not everybody's able to give as much as others but you're able to give what god's given to you you're able to give out of that over what god's given to you over and beyond and so i would challenge you with this principle right here start with the little bit you have maybe on that faith promise card it is just the the most minute little figure on there and just say well i can give this other you know 50 cents a week or a month hey if that's a stretch of faith for you do it Start with what you have. And you just see if God doesn't prove that next year, you'll have more to give out of. Not more to, to improve your, your living, but more to improve your giving. Start with what little bit you have. Pray about it. Let God give you peace about it in your heart. I'm telling you, if, if, you're, if you're clenching to it, white-knuckled, keep it. Because we don't need it. God's ministry will continue on with or without you. But he's given us an opportunity to invest temporary mammon into eternal treasures. Pray about it and let God give you a peace about it. And then you commit to giving that. And then be faithful out of what he's already given to you. Trust what he has said in regards to this in his word, what we've studied this morning, what we've studied last week, what we'll continue to study throughout this month, the, the, this month and see if he doesn't then begin to trust you with more that you can give out of. Start trusting him and he'll trust you with more to give out of. It is a great investment opportunity. This is the best, the best deal going in the world. You take the unrighteous mammon and you can convert it into eternal riches, true riches, as it's referred to here in verse 11. Listen, invest what is God's in this life. As we already made mention, it's all God's, amen? Amen. Invest what is God's in this life, and this is what he says, I'll reward you with what is your own in the next life. 
That's crazy. But that's what Jesus says here. If you can't trust another man's, then who's going to give you something for your own? That's eternal rewards. Trust what God says in his word. He'll reward you in the next life. Or we could just put it this way, be faithful with what he's loaned to you in this life and you will own true riches in the next life. It's on loan here, you'll own it there. That's awesome. That's awesome. John MacArthur said this, faithful use of one's earthly wealth is repeated, repeatedly tied to the accumulation of treasure in heaven. You will see that over and over again in scripture. But not just treasure, I'll also say anything that God's given to you. When you use it for his glory, you receive reward for it. That's the principle of this. And so Jesus closes out this parable in verse 13. Let's look at it again. He says, no servant can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Notice those words, I emphasized it. Cannot. It is impossible for you to serve both. You may think that you're juggling them, but you're not. You've made your choice which one you truly serve. We must choose which one. Choose which one. Every single day we make a choice about it. Every opportunity, every dollar we spend, we choose who and what we truly worship. We got to choose. The fact that Jesus places mammon parallel with God in this text signifies its idolatrous nature. It's like saying, yeah, this little God compared to God. You can't serve big G God, Yahweh, Jehovah, and serve little G God, mammon. You cannot. When we refuse to do that, to do what God convicts in our hearts to do with the resources that he's given to us, when we refuse to do that, we've made our choice who our real master is. You see, at the beginning of this parable, that servant, his master was only his master by name. He wasn't really his master. It was just the title. But by the end of it, he actually started doing what the master would want him to do, and he made him his Lord. He made him his master. There are a lot of people, I believe, in the world today who proclaim that God is their God, but yet they walk around with a little g, serving, worshiping, fighting for, sacrificing for, giving up their families for. Same way with the other things that God's given to us, with their talents and their abilities. Oh, they're chasing after the fame. They're chasing over the, uh, after the popularity. They're chasing after you know, what it might mean for their reputation later on in life. We have got to choose. We cannot serve both God and mammon. Who is it that we really serve? Who is it that we truly worship? You see, as God's children, the way to serve God with our money and not to serve money as our God is to invest in the souls of people, invest in the kingdom of God, and invest in the furtherance of the gospel. And you do that out of the abundance that God provides for you. I'm not saying take the food off your table that God's given to you to feed your family and make them starve. I'm not saying that. I'm saying what God has given to us above our needs. <laughs> and there's a message to be preached. There's a difference between needs and greeds, amen? Just take out of what God's given to you and invest in these three things. In this life, we don't get to see a lot of the fruit that comes from our stewardship, of, uh, our faithful stewardship of these things. We don't always get to see the fruit. I mean, I talk about it, and the men in the ministry up here, we talk about it, you know. You don't always get to see the fruit from the labors of your calling and your talent and being able to, your ability to preach and to teach. You don't always see the fruit through the response. You don't always see the fruit whenever you witness to somebody. You don't always get to see the fruit. And the same is true with the financial investments and everything else that God gives. You don't always get to see the fruit in this life, but I'm telling you that when this body fails, when this body dies, and we enter into the place where our Lord is, the presence of our God, 
and we begin to see those souls come out and welcome us, those friends that were impacted through our giving and through our serving and through our meager sacrifices in this life, I promise you this, we will not mourn over one cent, over one second, over one act of service that we committed to the Lord. We will be so overjoyed. We'll be so glad that we were faithful in stewarding what he gave to us. As those friends come out and they welcome us, I know many say, oh, well, they're going to come out and they're going to thank you for what you gave. I don't think so. I think they're just going to praise God. They're going to give glory because of what you gave. And let me tell you, that's the best thanks we can get. God is glorified. We have the opportunity right now to affect our future for the glory of God, to use our earthly resources to make an eternal investment. And so the challenge this morning is just simply this. Use your possessions with eternity in mind. Use these temporary things while thinking about what it will produce in eternity. Because that's what matters most as a faithful steward. Because that brings glory to God. If you're here this morning, eternity is on your mind, but it's on your mind for a different reason because you don't know for certain where you're going to spend eternity. You don't know how you can be assured that when you die that you will be in the presence of God. You will be in the presence of Jesus Christ and other saints who have gone on. Listen, if, if that's why you're, you're considering eternity this morning because you don't have the security and you don't have the assuredness that you are going to be there, I want you to understand first and foremost, God is not asking you for money or for service or for religious sacrifice in order for you to get there. He's not doing that. Let me tell you, he's already provided all that was needed for your sins to be forgiven and for you to receive Christ as your Savior. He he already provided all for for, for you to escape the the eternal consequences of your sin. And he did that when he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross. When Jesus willingly laid down his life so that three days later he he rose back up again, he raised his life back up again. Listen, that opened up the gateway for us to believe on him through faith and believe on him and receive Jesus Christ as our Savior. Never have to face the eternal consequences of our sin, which is separation from God. I want you to understand this morning, if you are here and you've never accepted, you've never believed on Jesus Christ, and and, and this morning, the Spirit of God is tugging on your heart, God's Spirit tells us in His Scripture, today is the day of salvation. And it also promises this, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. So if that's for you this morning, and that switch happens in your heart, and you put your faith and you believe on Him today, would you be sure to share that with us before you leave? As you're walking out the door, just let us know. You, I just want you to know, preacher, today, God saved me. Or how about this? Let somebody else know, hey, you know what? Today, God convicted me. I'm going to be a better steward. I'm going to be a better steward of the things that I have, that I've been given. Share with others how God's working in your life. And who knows, maybe that will be a work in their life.